And it's finally time to do some comic book reviews after that very lengthy last presentation about Royal Church in the Holocaust. I'm going to do Will Eisner, a seminal figure in the history of comics. The average pub member of the public w won't recognise the name. He's not Jack Kirby or Stan Lee, or perhaps the craze of Superman. But he goes, his history in comics goes right back to the 1930s. However, I want to concentrate on his graphic novel, as much as I hate the term, the comics to me. Um, the 1970s, A Contract in God. With God, this was a his sort of set of stories that was set in a, a tenement in Dropsy Avenue in the Bronx, an address he uses in other comics as well, which tie into it. I, if you look at the picture on the screen in a minute, you'll notice it's drawn in sort of sepia. Eisner was never the most realistic artist. He makes a good use of the abilities he has. You'll see that when we get to figures later. A tenement in the Bronx, at 55 Dropsy Avenue, the Bronx, New York, not far from the elevated station stood the tenement. Like the others, it was built around 1920s, when the decaying apartment in housing in Lower Manhattan could no longer accommodate the flood of emigrants. Most of his work in this particular book is concentrated on various immigrants. You have Jews a couple of times, you have other families, Italians, the odd small amount of um, Irish people, although he, they pop up more in some of his other works. The first story in the um, series, which it's named after, is the Epionomius, A Contract with God. We'll get to that after I give some brief background on Eisler. So let me do some basic background info on Will Eisner so people know I'm talking about. I'm certainly not going to read out this entire article, which skips down quite a long way, but just some as some basic info. Will Eisner, born March the 6th, 1917, Brooklyn, New York, died January the 3rd, 2005, Fort Lauderdale, American author and illustrator. The comics form is a combination of two of the most powerful means of communication. We have words and pictures, which accounts for the injuries of this medium and the progress it's making. Will Eisner is widely considered the father of the American graphic novel. As I say, it's a term I hate. I'll get round to explaining one day in a separate presentation. When Eisner began his work, comics were looked down by those who were worried about young people reading. They certainly were, because that was the early 1930s. By the 2000s, however, Eisner was really appreciated as a man who elevated comic book methods, telling stories with words and sequential pictures to respect in the form of the graphic novel. In a career that spanned seven decades, Eisner pioneered many of the techniques that became widespread during the graphic novel boom that began in the 1990s. He certainly did, and a lot of what he did is still nicked by later um, artists and writers. And you will see it recycled in places like the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but you won't be aware it's coming from there. In the late 1930s and 40s, he invented a not-so-superhero called the Spirit to compete with Superman. Yep. The spirit is sometimes called the first middle-class superhero. He has no actual powers and is a rather strange, whimsical character. He's worth his own presentation, though. In the spirit stories, Eisner proved that comics could tell intelligent stories about serious themes like loneliness and doubt. In the 1950s and 60s, he left comics to experiment with sequential art. Then in 1978, he published what is considered the first graphic novel, <sighs> A Contract with God and Other Tenement Stories, which is what we are looking at now. It gives you some idea of the long career the man had. Also, it should be noted, the Eisner Awards, which are awarded to outstanding comic book artists and writers, are named after him, which should, should be an indication of the respect the community has for him. Here's another page from A Contract with God, setting the scene further. Passengers in transit, for they were on a voyage of upward mobility. They were intent on their own survival, busy with reading their young and dreaming of a better life they knew existed uptown. What community spirit there was stemmed from the hostility towards a common enemy, the landlord. 55 Dropsy Avenue was typical of most tenements. Its tenants were varied. Some came and went. Many remained there for a lifetime, imprisoned by poverty or other factors. It was a sort of micro-village, and the world was Dropsy Avenue. Within the walls, its walls, great dramas were played out. There was no real, real privacy, no anonymity. 
one was either a participant or a member of the front row audience. Everyone knew about everybody. Essentially, the, the average tenement that you'll find in many cities, except this is set during the Great Depression where things are particularly run down. The first story in the book, after which it is named, is about a Jewish man's relationship with God after the death of his daughter. It's particularly effective. I read it when I was 16, and to me, comics at that point were still Marvel, DC, the odd independent publication, but I'd never encountered anything like Eisner's work, and it was a sudden revelation. It was a story about real people who could be very real and about very serious the- themes. This page is perhaps one of the gloomiest pages in the entire comic. All we have is a door, a puddle of water, and a man going up a staircase talking to an old lady who's a housekeeper. And yet, it's one of the gloomiest things I've ever seen in comics. Not so unusual, a father brings up a child with care and love only to lose her, plucked as it were from his arms by an unseen hand, the hand of God. It happens to lots of people every day, to others maybe. If you look at the placement of the figure on the stairs, the absolute slump of it, the water running everywhere, the feeling of despondency and hopelessness comes across very strongly. As I say, Eisner is not the most talented at drawing figures, but for conveying emotion or setting a mood, few equal him. This next page when I was 16 was a million miles away from the X-Men duking it out with their biggest rival, or even some of the better written stuff from 2000 AD, which was tended to be more sort of linear and get to a point than a lot of the soap opera n- nature of uh, the typified American comics. Much as I love American superhero comics, I'm not going to pretend that they are uh, immune from criticism. Their, their endless reset buttons and their endless soap operas do get a bit silly after a while. The best writers actually embrace the silliness something I'll get around to eventually to commenting on. But here we have an old Jewish man. His daughter's just died. He's just buried her. A candle in a room, the rain peeing it down outside. It should not have happened to Fribby Hirsch because Fribby Hirsch had a contract with God. So what's this contract with God, we wonder? Well, it does tell you that, but I'd ruin the whole story by saying that. Let's just say that the um, back and forth between man and God is a central theme of the story which is for a, was fairly heavy going, and a contract is a contract. It was all, after all, a solemn agreement of many years. The page on the right might be worth commenting on for those um, unfamiliar with Jewish mourning traditions. I was at 16. Years later, I realised he's sitting Shiva, which is obligatory on Jews during a mourning period, that you don't shave and you sit on low stools, etc., to express your regret for the death of a loved one. I'm going to end on this page. There are, as I say, stories on several other things, including a a singer having an affair with an older Italian opera singer, Um, a young man on the cusp of manhood coming into his own as a man, a strange and rather disturbing story about the fate of a a pervert who, who ends his own fate. That night, Rimi Frimi Hirsch confronted God. You violated our contract, and the old tenement trembled under the fire, fury of the dialogue. If God requires that men honour their agreements, then is God not also obligated? That's a million miles away from the sort of stuff you're going to find in the in the world of superhero stuff, and it actually comes to a a point afterwards where you can't be sure if God is a psychopath or if Frimmy is right. Well, what's uh, There is no definite conclusion. You're left with a, a kind of make your own mind up about who is right and who's contra- who is right about this agreement. If you notice the art again, as I say, Eisner started in the 30s. His figure work is not particularly great by modern standards. However... If you notice how he arranges things on a page and lays them out, that's where he shines. The first panel with a door and a man behind it and everyone's scared outside that door going, what the hell is going on in there, guys? Lightning racking a building. The sepia tone suits it because it gives it a feeling of it's timeless. It could be it's it's not 
that's trapped in a technicolor world, but rather a more grim world. Hirsch is upraised, face shouting at the sky, and he's sort of oh, he's desire to challenge God himself. I would say Eisner, with this one work alone, would have earned his reputation as one of the greatest figures in comics. But he has numerous works of, that are worth exploring. His spirit comics, I mentioned earlier, are in a similar but also very different tone. And I will get round to them, as I think people might find them interesting. But for now, I'll close by saying that this was a comic that made a huge impression when he was a teen. And it's still fairly powerful now.